So usually there's like a lag time of 30 to 60 seconds as people start coming in and, you know, coming in from other sections other sessions that might run a bit over so yeah we usually sure. just wait a couple of minutes before actually starting that's great i've done a few um dry runs of this as well and i'm kind of up i'm i'm around the 20 minute mark yeah perfect So on my shared screen, I can see you and me, but mm -hmm. can you can you see that? Yeah. On my on my shared screen. No, we can just uh, see your slides. Okay, great. Yeah. So people are starting to come in, but we'll give it another like a couple of minutes. Okay. All right, I think we are good to get going. People will just come in when they come in. Okay. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce Olivia Handler, who is part of the EHDN or the European Huntington's Disease Network. And she's basically who you go to if you want Enroll HD data or information about Enroll HD. So Olivia, why don't you take it away and explain what Enroll HD is all about? Thank you so much, Mustafa. And thank you especially to HDEO for inviting me to speak to you today about Enroll HD. Um, I think one of the main things that I want to get across is um, the incredible infrastructure that is um, enabling us to have the Enroll HD platform and to speak to you about some of the outcomes um, that we're now starting to see, some of the achievements and the ways in which people are collaborating and participating. So I think I will move this on to the next slide and um, I will just show you uh, what the key aims are of our research platform. So this is a clinical research platform that is um, dedicated to Huntington's disease families. And there are three key aims. The first is that we really want to speed up progress within clinical trials. So the platform is in a position whereby it can really work with external partners and CROs in terms of whether it's identifying potential sites, whether it is um, supporting with participant recruitment, um, but there's a whole host of different ways in which the platform can support those activities. We also are in a very fortunate position to be able to have so much information, data, biosamples gathered from Huntington's disease families around the world that we're now able to be um, uh, providing people with data sets, biospecimens, so that they can really answer questions which previously may not have been possible. And last but not least, to improve our understanding of um, best care practices and sharing those within the Enroll HD, well, within the HD research community. I think one of the things that's been so incredible about the platform is that this infrastructure has been built through a collaboration of dedicated HD families, um, clinical study sites from around the world. Um, the CHDI Foundation funds the Enroll HD network and um, working with um, the patient advocacy groups such as HDO, who've been a tremendous sort of uh, communicator on our behalf and spreading the word. Um, and last but not least, a, a small army of people who were in place to really help um, make Enroll HD work on a day-to-day -day basis. So our operations team, again, um, spread out across different countries, really making that possible. 
all of those contributions come together to give it a really dynamic infrastructure. And um, that infrastructure can then be used to support and develop um, platform resources that we can then share with other clinical trials, other clinical studies, providing data to researchers. And it really hopes, um, it really helps us um, deliver on each of these aims. I'm just gonna take a moment to talk to you about the Enroll HD study. And um, I've attended several of the sessions over the last two days and Enroll HD has been referenced a few times. Um, it's the largest longitudinal observational study of Huntington's disease ever. And um, we think of it as a family study. The study is really at the core of the platform and many things are possible because of that study. Um, and, and so it's really open to anybody who um, has been through testing through a local genetic service and uh, they know that they carry the gene and they may or may not be showing symptoms. Um, it's also open to people who are family members who have not gone through testing and who are at risk of Huntington's disease. We also invite people who have gone through testing locally and who know that they don't carry the gene and we also invite companions and caregivers of people who are um, a part of Huntington's disease families. Um, less of a focus is recruitment of community controls. We very much focus on these other four categories in terms of our recruitment. And I'll, I'll come back to our recruitment strategy a little bit later on. Um, I wanted to give you a, a sense of the size of Enroll HD. We um, are so fortunate to be able to be reaching milestones, which we are so delighted by. Um, we're represented in four global regions, so North America, Latin America, Europe, Australasia, 21 countries are participating and close to 160 sites are recruiting across those countries. We have over 25,000 participants enrolled in the study. And we also talk about active participants. Now these are people who are coming back to sites year on year, they're maintaining their contact. If they can't come back to sites for an in-person visit, then the sites are reaching out to them and having a remote phone contact. Um, so yeah, we're, we're absolutely delighted with the success of the Enroll HD study and we're looking forward to seeing it grow year upon year. Um, I just wanted to touch on a single slide about the impact of COVID-19. And again, um, I think in the Roche talk earlier today, there was talk of a, a participants, a study trial participants coming back for their um, trial treatments, which is absolutely fantastic. But studies like Enroll HD had to be paused on an in-person basis because site staff were redeployed. It wasn't safe for participants to come into hospital settings. Um, so we had to think quite quickly about ways in which we could um, manoeuvre our, our contact with participants and help to keep um, them engaged. So what, what you can see here in this chart up on the left hand side is the total number of in-person visits. And across this axis here is the, the months of the year going from January through to December. The orange and the green line represent um, 2018 and 2019 trends for people coming into clinics, into the study sites for their in-person visits. And it consistently is over 1000 visits a month. When you look at what happened in 2020, you can see very rapidly during the first half of that year, the number of inpatient visits or in-person visits dropped off dramatically. Um, and then around the sort of end of the first wave, hospitals were able to reopen, sites were able to um, reinitiate their research activities, including Enroll HD, and, and the number of um, in-person visits steadily starts to increase, but then you can see the effect of the second wave of COVID towards the end of last year. The chart down here tells us the number of remote visits. So these are phone contact visits from sites to their participants. And pre-COVID, so 2018, 2019, we had very rarely over 200 visits um, made by phone contact per month. But then you can see with um, COVID, the number of phone contacts really significantly increased to over 400, nearly 500 a month at some periods last year. And then as in-person visits start to come back in, you can see that the remote contacts are starting to drop off. And I think what this really says to me is um, the commitment of the study teams, 
that are working getting the messaging out to sites, the sites who are working so hard with contacting the participants. Um, so despite the pandemic and despite it otherwise pausing on some of these in-person visits, we were still able to um, make a significant amount of contact um, and, and making sure that those participants remain engaged and hopefully we can see them in person in their next visit. I think if we could just um, briefly go through how people can find out about Enroll HD, where to find it. If you have a pen and paper to the side, please write down the website. It's enroll-hd.org. Um, there's all sorts of information on this website, but the bit that I really want to hone in on is about the participation link. If you click on participate, it will give you a drop down menu of clinic locations. And then by clicking on clinic locations, it takes you to quite a nice interactive map. Um, so you can put in your search location and your search radius, and then you can click search and it will pin drop where different Enroll HD sites are. By hovering on that um, pin drop, it will tell you the name of the site. So here we can see Columbia University. And whilst you're on that page, if you scroll down, um, you will see that uh, there's the option to expand the clinic details and it will tell you um, who the PI is and who the main Enroll HD study coordinator is. Um, so if, if you're not in Enroll HD, you'd like to find more about A, whether it's somewhere that you can get to and B, who to contact, then I really recommend um, a few clicks on this website to try and um, to point you in the right direction. So the Enroll HD study itself um, asks participants to come in for annual visits. Um, every participant is asked to uh, contribute a core set of data. So we take a brief demographics information, medical history, asking about what medications you may be on, if you have other conditions or diseases or medical events. Um, if you have gone through local CAG testing, um, we ask for that result to be entered onto the database. And then we also um, take a 10 milliliter, so a one tube sample of blood for research CAG type genotyping, which is all done at a central lab um, uh, over in Italy, in Milan. And then there's a, a set of standard assessments, so motor function, behavior, and cognitive assessments. We also have the option of extending those assessments, and this is really down to any individual participant's time um, and whether they would like to be able to con contribute additional data. Um, and to an extent, it also depends on the site resources. So making sure that they have the research staff available um, to be able to support with doing additional interviews, questionnaires and assessments. The consent form itself will ask participants to sign up to um, collection of these data and the 10 milliliter blood collection for research genotyping. But we also have optional components. Um, so you can elect yes or no to agreeing to up to 30 more mils, so three more test tubes of blood for um, looking into genetic modifiers and biomarkers, more extended family history information, so really trying to understand how Huntington's disease has been passed down through generations within any given family, and linking to other study data as well. Data privacy is really important across the board for any research activity and Enroll HD um, uses something that we call an HDID. So when a participant comes in for their very first visit and after they've been consented, we take what we call their unique identifying information. So it would be last name, mother's maiden name, date of birth, information like that. And we push it through a one-way um, secure algorithm and that generates a nine digit HDID. That nine digit HDID is then entered onto the Enroll HD database. So no participant identifying information goes on to that database. When we get to the point of sharing the data with researchers, we take that nine digit code and we do it, we put it through another recoding process. So it takes those nine digits and then it turns out a different nine digit code. So it introduces another layer of security in terms of protecting that participant's identity. And when we've kind of gone through other um, data curation practices um, and making sure that those data are as clean, high quality, and um, making sure that we're really protecting the participant, we'll then make them available to verified researchers. 
the success of the platform and I think one of the sort of most um, rewarding aspects of participating in Enroll HD is that uh, CHDI, is, as we heard from Simon's talk earlier, is, is committed to breaking down barriers and making sure that access to data is made as easy as possible. If we can make it as easy as possible, people will more likely um, submit requests to access it. And that's exactly what we're seeing, which is fantastic. Um, we need data sharing to be able to develop HD therapeutics. We need to answer so many more questions about Huntington's disease. The volume of data um, and, and the collection of biosamples that we've got is unprecedented for Huntington's disease, and we can make that available to researchers. And it really encourages a very wide variety of um, projects and ideas to come forward. I just want to touch on one of the outputs from the platform um, made possible by the Enroll HD study, and, and these are the data sets. So we call them periodic data sets, and so far we've released five of these over the course of the last sort of seven or eight years. And what you can see here on this slide is that for PDS1, which was a good, good number of years ago now, we had a data set sample of 1,000, almost 1,500 participants um, in that data set. It was very early days really for Enroll HD. Our last data set, which was released on the 31st of December in 2020, um, had a very impressive number of over 21,000 participants. So that's one way of kind of looking at the size. Another way is really looking at the number of visits. So Enroll HD is a longitudinal um, study, so we're inviting participants to come back year on year. And if we just take a quick look at the first PDS, then you can see that we had over 2,000 visits, so very few follow-up visits there, compared to the last release, which had close to 56,000 visits included, so a tremendous amount of data. And it's being used. We have here... Um, 358 downloads of the periodic data sets. And we also have another sort of um, specified data set process as well, of which there are a couple of hundred in the pipeline. So the word is out there, researchers are using it, and we're, we're really, really delighted um, with the amount that this data is being used. One way that we can measure the success of those data sets, but it's not the only way, um, is to look at the number of peer reviewed publications. And again, if you're interested, I would encourage you to look at the enrollhd.org website, click on researchers, and then click on publications. And we have an online library that kind of tells you each of the publications that there are, and then links to access those um, on their various uh, journal websites. And where possible, you can access the PDFs. Um, there are close to 70 uh, publications that are already out there with several more in preparation. So uh, again, an, another excellent uh, uh, milestone there. But it isn't just about the data that are coming out as much as that is invaluable. Um, the platform's able to research a whole host of different research initiatives, whether this is clinical trials, imaging studies, other observational studies, biosamples collections, a number of you might be involved in HD Clarity, for example. Um, these are both CHGI funded studies, but they're also studies from external sponsors that we're working with. Um, and, and this list grows and it grows on um, every couple of months, we're seeing kind of new contacts coming in and it's exactly how we want the platform to be utilized. I think it's really important as well to just take the opportunity to underline the importance of, um, on the one hand, we've got 25,000 participants and we're delighted by that. But at the same time, we still need to recruit more participants, especially with the advent of more clinical trials coming through the pipeline. A couple of years ago, we took a little snapshot of what was happening and we had um, three clinical trials running at uh, a number of Enroll HD sites. Some of those sites were participating in one, two, or all three of those clinical trials. When we looked at the total number of Enroll HD participants at that time, we had close to 9,000 participants. These clinical trials were only recruiting manifest participants. So suddenly our number dropped to 5,000 um, manifest participants. And then when you apply some light eligibility criteria, the number reduced again to just over 3,000. And then at a site level, a more rigorous screening process was applied and the number reduced again to 1,000. And ultimately there were 858 participants randomized for these three clinical trials. 
So hopefully kind of as we kind of break down each of these layers of the process towards getting participants enrolled in clinical trials, um, you can see how many we need, nearly 9,000 at the beginning um, to, to result in that 858 that were randomized. We also need to think very carefully about the recruitment strategy. And that's something that we've been working quite hard on, especially with patient advocacy groups such as HDO. Um, we know that for clinical trials, it's very important for us to promote inclusion of pre-manifest participants into enroll HD and also individuals in early manifest HD. We sent out a communication, a coordinated communication, working with associations, working with sites, working with genetic centers um, around 2017. And we really wanted this blue line and the pink line that represent manifest early stage HD and pre-manifest to increase. And that's exactly what we have seen happen year upon year. And hopefully as we move forwards into 2021, we'll see these trajectories continuing. I'm just gonna hopefully draw us to a bit of a close um, in terms of uh, new directions. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to talk to you about self-enroll HD. So this is another CHGI funded directive. Um, we're looking to establish a global digital registry for Huntington's disease. This will link to Enroll HD. So if you're already participating in Enroll and you'd like to participate in self-enroll, then those connections would be made to link the data. However, and importantly, you can only take part in self-enroll. So this will be set up through an easy to use, accessible from computer or your smartphone. It'll be a web-based or an or a, a iPhone-based app, for example. And we'll be looking to capture some core clinical data, asking participants to donate a saliva sample so that we can do a research CAG genotype and working with external partners as well to build in additional assessment tools through sub-studies or add-on studies. The real advantage and the thing that we're very excited about is the collection of these data will be made possible through remote environments. So from people's homes, they'll be able to do it. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, um, you'll be able to participate. The, the kind of workup that we're going to do for self-enroll is that we will get it up and running in the US in the first instance. And we're looking at that happening in um, 2022. And I think once we've established the platform in the US and we've got it working exactly as we want to, then we'll look to uh, rolling it out on a, on a more global level. This is just a little participant flow for you of how we would envisage self-enroll working. Um, so hopefully word of mouth, advertisements, um, working with the Enroll HD sites, we'd be able to recruit potential participants. They would register via a, a web or an app-based portal, um, provide their electronic consent. They would receive a saliva kit sample request and um, receive that kit. And then they would also complete some core data. Um, and then their um, research genotype would be determined by a centralized lab. And going forwards, that participant would then receive notifications about potential sub-studies that they might be eligible for, and they'd receive reminders about the self-enroll study, and potentially also a news feed about um, notable events in the uh, and interesting uh, news where the items in, in the HD research community. Um, and I think hopefully uh, you'll have got a sense of how um, many people are involved in making the Enroll HD platform um, the success that it is, and we're really excited to continue expanding the network. Um, it's really down to a, a dedication of the family members, the associations, the clinical site staff, the Enroll HD study team, CHGI Foundation. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're incredibly thankful and, and it feels um, like we're in a very privileged position to be able to um, work together and, and make such a united success. So thank you everybody who um, may have already been participating or contributing to Enroll HD. Um, and hopefully people have got a few questions for me now. So uh, I'll draw this to a close. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, definitely such a nice talk, Olivia, and really talking about some of the great work Enroll HD is doing in helping support scientists in you know, potential development of their research. Um, there's a few questions and it actually ties into one of my questions as well. So are there plans for Enroll HD to expand into other continents, for example, into Africa or Asia? And what are some of the challenges you see or face 
that has prevented you from doing that so far? It's a really good question. Um, so I think one of the things that we have to really uh, emphasize is that setting up in Role HD is a very resource intensive exercise. So any new region that we go to, there's a, a whole host of regulatory, operational infrastructure things that we have to overcome. Um, of course, we would love to be represented in more of those regions, but it's just simply not possible, I think, to kind of expand into every single country or every single region. Um, so it takes a substantial effort to run and maintain the study already. Um, so uh, we know that this isn't satisfying for, for certain countries, but we're hoping that with the advent of self enroll that we'll be able to um, expand those participation opportunities for more people irrespective of where they are around the world. Right, got it. Um, yeah, so there's another question. What do countries like Brazil, uh, how, do, how does someone, let's say, register and enroll, enroll HG who's a Brazilian? Um, so we uh, aren't operating in Brazil at the moment. The, the countries that we've got in Latin America are Colombia and Chile and Argentina. Um, we did make, um, significant effort to try and set up in Brazil a number of years ago and it ended up taking several years to kind of try and work through the regulatory um, situation there and it, and it just wasn't proving feasible and at the same time we had sort of competing demands with other countries as well so um, we just had to had to make a call at that time and focus our efforts on starting up the other countries where we were able to kind of make more progress more quickly and 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 and, and take that direction. All right, thanks for that answer. So there's a question that asks, uh, they don't see Scan uh, Scandinavia on the map that you showed, but there is, Enroll HD is active in Scandinavia, correct? Um, it's not at the moment. So um, oh, okay. I think we're very close to um, building in Norway. Um, that one is certainly on the horizon. Um, we have excellent research contacts um, with uh, colleagues in Sweden, for example, um, but we have had some difficulties there regarding the biobanking setup um, in terms of um, trying to get the biospecimens um, out of the country. So um, again, it, there, is, there is some sort of regulatory complications where it just means that some of the uh, the, our abilities to set up in some of these countries is is particularly difficult, um, but we're we're doing whatever we can where we can. Yeah, totally. And just coming back to that aspect uh, of the regulatory aspect, what can patients and family members do to drive this forward? I know there's something coming from Enroll, but is there anything the community can do to drive this forward? Um, I think I think anything where we can kind of campaign for the awareness and the importance of um, this. Uh, you know, our, our, our attempts to really globalize Huntington's disease research. Um, so I think just promoting what's already out there and what's been made possible, um, improving people's awareness and, and giving them the direction of where to find information. I think that can be very empowering to know exactly what's going on and what progress is, uh, is underway. Yeah, all right. I think there's a couple of questions more to go. Um, there's one that asks if, self-enroll HD is set to replace enroll HD? No, it's it's not going, it, it, would, it would be very much sort of a, a complement to what we have. Um, so enroll HD is collecting data in a very different way um, to how we envisage um, self-enroll uh, to operate. So it would be very much a complementary study to enroll HD and by no means would be replacing it. And uh, what's the major difference? So is this mainly because to overcome that regulatory aspect and have more of a remote access approach? I think, I think that's definitely a benefit to it. Um, but I think the opportunities as well from a research perspective that self-enroll will open up to us will be, um, uh, you know, kind of completely novel to us. For example, whether we can link, if people choose to link with their wearable devices, um, looking at their activity monitors, um, doing their tests um, sort of direct onto their phones and submitting data, um, I think we'll be able to generate masses of data um, remotely and it kind of removes um, the requirement of having to have people come into clinic for in-person visits. So I think, I think it will generate an enormous opportunity for, for ways in which we can take HD research forward. All right, cool. So I think we're running low on time, but there's a couple of final questions. They're more big question, 
big picture questions. So Dylan asks, what are some of the major findings that have resulted from Enroll HD? And I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so um, I think I think yeah, lots of lots of the information that has come out from the GWAS study. So look, using the Enroll HD biosamples to inform us about genetic modifiers. Um, looking at medication trends um, across different countries has been another uh, research activity and, and published finding um, and, and sort of looking at um, disease progression and, vari and, and the variables that go into that. So I think um, if I could direct Dylan to going on to the publications section of that website and then he will get um, the, 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 the information at his fingertips to, to really see the ways in which those findings have um, led to peer review publications, but there's, there's, there's a lot out there. Yeah, for sure. It's advanced so much uh, scientific research. There's, it's really a good tool as a registry to have all this access to patient data yeah. to you know, work with. Um, our final question is more along the, what are the eligibility criteria to make a site participate in Enroll HD? Yep, yeah, so we do we do have a set of criteria. So um, it would be for them to have, a, it would be a Huntington's disease clinic and that can be a genetics based clinic, neurology based or psychiatry based. Um, and then uh, one of the clinicians working there would need to be certified for one of the motor examinations that we do in Huntington's disease. It's called the UHDRS motor exam um, to be able to have the ability to collect blood um, and, and to make sure that you can ship the blood as well. Um, so making sure that side of the logistics is in place. Um, having clinic space, um, so often the participant will be seen usually by two or three people for an Enroll HD visit. So making sure that you can kind of carousel a participant around different rooms. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something else. Um, oh, internet access. I mean. Who would be without internet access at the moment? But it, it is important in a hospital setting um, to have a reliable internet access. So I think as much as uh, sites can enter the data directly is, is a huge benefit to everybody. So um, link, linking it online to the Enroll HD database is, is definitely a bonus. All right. I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming Thank you on. Thank you so much for having me. And giving us a detailed representation of what Enroll HD is all about and how the community can also drive it forward by participating. Yes, thank you. Thank you so right. much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Um, the next session is by Charles Sabine. It's our last session, unfortunately. Um, it's been a fantastic Congress so far, so you can hop on over to the last session. We'll be talking about uh, some of his work with uh, HD patients. And he's basically a journalist who contributed to making Dancing in the Vatican. So you can hear all about that in the next session.